Hi, and welcome to this lecture on interrupts and energy modes. In this lecture, we will learn about how interrupts work on the FM32 and how we can switch between the different energy modes. We'll start the discussion today by talking about interrupts. On the Cortex M3 CPUs, interrupts are specified in an interrupt vector and handled by a dedicated unit, which is called the Nested Vector Interrupt Controller, or for short, we're just going to refer to it as NVIC. The interrupt vector contains a list of all the available interrupts on the device. Each entry in the vector table is a pointer to the corresponding interrupt handler. On the right hand side of this slide you can see a general interrupt vector on an EFM32. Conceptually, each entry in the vector table is also given an IRQ number. Interrupts internal to the ARM Cortex core have negative IRQ numbers, while de device-specific interrupts, such as all the peripherals on the FM32, have positive numbers. On the left-hand side, you can see some of the device-specific interrupts on the EFM32. The vector table is by default located at the start of memory, but this can be changed from software. When an interrupt occurs, the NVIC will look up the corresponding interrupt handler in the vector table and then transfer execution to this interrupt handler. Interrupt activation is controlled in two steps. An interrupt must be enabled both in the peripheral registers and in the interrupt controller. Each peripheral in the EFM32 that can generate interrupts contains at least two registers, the interrupt flag and the interrupt enable registers. When an event occurs in a peripheral, such as a packet arriving on a UART line or a timer overflowing, the corresponding bit in the interrupt flag register is set. If the same bit is also set in the interrupt enable, an IRQ event is sent to NVIC and the IRQ is marked as pending. If the IRQ event is enabled in NVIC, the CPU will then enter the interrupt handler. The interrupt state within the interrupt controller is handled automatically when the CPU enters and exits the interrupt service routine. On the other hand, the interrupt flag in the peripheral is only set by an event and must be cleared by software. On the next slides, we will see what the consequence of this is. Here we see the normal case where some event occurs and an interrupt is executed. Here we assume that the interrupt is enabled both in the peripheral and the interrupt controller already. When the event occurs, the interrupt flag goes high, which will then cause the interrupt handler to start executing the interrupt. Inside the interrupt service routine, the interrupt flag is cleared, and when the service routine returns, the program execution continues where it left off. Now, let's have a look at what happens if the interrupt service routine does not clear the flag. In this case, when the ISR returns, the interrupt controller will see that the flag is set and will then trigger another interrupt. If the interrupt service routine never clears this flag, the code will be stuck in an endless loop and the program execution will never return to the normal program flow. Another thing that I want to mention is that it's generally considered good practice to clear the flag early in the interrupt service routine. The reason is exemplified on this slide. If another event occurs while the interrupt flag is still high, the second event will be lost because there is no way to see that the event occurred. For this reason, it is common to clear the flag early in the interrupt service routine to minimize the time where the interrupt flag is high. Here we see some example code that enables interrupts. In the example on this slide, we enable two interrupts for the timer 2 peripheral the interrupt for overflow and the interrupt for compare capture channel 0. Each interrupt flag corresponds to one bit in the interrupt enable register and can therefore be ORed together and enabled at the same time. We use the emlib function timer int enable to enable the interrupt in the peripheral registers. This function takes two parameters the first is uh, the peripheral struct from CMSYS, and the second is a bit mask representing all the interrupts we want to enable. The last line enables the timer2 interrupt line in the interrupt controller. 
The only parameters to this function is the IRQ number. In the header files for the FM32, there are globally defined constants for all the IRQs. Here's an example of an interrupt handler for the interrupts that we enabled on the previous slide. In the startup code provided by ngMicro, default implementations for interrupt handlers are defined. These are weakly linked, so when a developer creates a new function, it will override the default implementations. The naming convention is exemplified on this slide. First is the name of the IRQ signal, followed by an underscore and a postfix IRQ handler. Interrupt handlers does not return any value, nor do they take any parameters. In the interrupt handler, we first retrieve and store the list of interrupt flags, and then clear those flags in the peripheral registers. We can then check the local copy of the interrupt flags to see which interrupt occurred. Now we move on to energy modes. Energy modes is a very important concept on the EFM32, and efficient use of these modes is key to achieve a good energy consumption. As we go down in energy modes, more and more of the peripherals are disabled, which allows the MCU to operate at lower and lower current consumptions. Out of reset, the EFM32 is in energy mode 0, also called the active mode or the run mode. In this mode, the CPU is active and all peripherals can be enabled. Power consumption down to 150 micrograms per megahertz is possible in this mode. The next energy mode, EM1, is entered when we put the CPU to sleep. All the other peripherals can be enabled in this mode, and the current consumption is as low as 45 microamps per megahertz. For instance, while receiving a large chunk of data over a UART, the MCU can be in EM1, while DMA transfers data from UART peripheral to the RAM. When we go down to EM2, or deep sleep, the high frequency clock is turned off which means that the high-frequency peripherals, such as the UART, is unavailable. This is a very useful sleep mode because of the drastic reduction in power consumption. In EM2, the low-frequency clock is still allowed to run, so all the low-frequency peripherals are still available. This includes, for instance, the real-time counter, the low-energy UART, and the low-energy sensor interface. Energy mode 3 is the same as energy mode 2 but also the low frequency clock is switched off in EM3. So only the peripherals which are able to operate asynchronously are available. Examples include the I2C address recognition and the pulse counter when clocked from an external clock. All the way down to EM3, we still have full RAM and register retention. When we go down to EM4, we can have extremely low current consumption, only 20 nanoamps. But when the MCU wakes up, it has to go through a reset before we start executing code. Each energy mode can be entered directly from software by executing the wait for interrupt instruction. When the MCU is in a sleep mode and receives an interrupt event, it will wake up and go to EM0 to start executing code. Again, note that if we are in EM4, we have to go through a full reset in order to wake up. Here we see how we can choose which energy mode we want to go to. When the CPU executes the wait for interrupt instruction, it will first check if the sleep deep bit in the system control register is set. If this bit is cleared, we will enter EM1. On the other hand, if the sleep dip bit is set, we will enter either EM2 or EM3. The only difference between energy mode 2 and energy mode 3 is the state of the low frequency oscillators. If the low frequency oscillators are running, we will enter EM2, and if they are not, we will enter EM3. Note that we have to enable or disable the low frequency oscillators before we execute the wait for interrupt instruction to choose between EM2 and EM3. To enter EM4, we have to write a special sequence to the EM4 control register. This sequence can be found in the reference manual. To make it easy to switch between energy modes, the EMLib API provides functions to enter the low energy modes directly. 
These functions perform the operations discussed on a previous slide in order to enter the low energy modes. When entering EM2 or EM3, some or all of the oscillators will be turned off. The restore parameters on these functions can be set to true if you want to restore the oscillators to their state prior to entering the energy mode when the MCU is waking up. Note that this is done in software and will not be done before the interrupt that woke up the MCU has finished executing. Here is an overview of the EFM32. A similar figure can be found in the reference manual for each device family. On this slide you will note that all of the peripherals are color-coded with a corresponding energy mode. The color here indicates the lowest possible energy mode where the peripheral can still be active. As an example, the UART module is available in energy mode 0 and 1. This is because it needs the high frequency clock to operate. However, if the application can get away with a slow UART connection, the lower energy UART can be used. The lower energy UART allows baud rates up to 9600 and only uses the low frequency clock. Therefore, it can be used down to energy mode 2. It is useful to have an understanding of how the program flow is when using the energy modes and interrupts. These slides illustrate how the CPU will operate when using the wait for interrupt instruction to enter EM1. On the left hand side we have the CPU executing some program instruction by instruction until it reaches the wait for interrupt instruction. After this the CPU will go to sleep and the EFM32 will be in energy mode 1 until some event wakes it up. When an event occurs, the CPU will start executing the interrupt handler. The interrupt handler will execute all of its instructions and when the handler returns, execution will continue right after the wait for interrupt instruction in the original program. Some applications are completely event driven and only uses interrupt service routine to execute code. In this case, the sleep on exit functionality of the ARM Cortex interrupts can be used. If the sleep on exit bit in the system control register is set, the CPU will go back to sleep immediately after returning from an interrupt handler. In this case, the FM32 will by default be in a sleep mode, and when an event occurs, it will start executing the interrupt handler for that event. It will then go right back to sleep and wait for the next event to occur and then execute the corresponding interrupt for that event. Until now, we have not discussed what happens when an interrupt occurs while another interrupt is currently executing. Interrupts on the EFM32 have eight configurable priority levels, with zero being the highest and seven the lowest. By default, all interrupts have priority level zero. Both internal cortex-specific interrupts and the device-specific interrupts have configurable priorities. There are only three exceptions. Reset, which always have the highest priority, the non-maskable interrupt, which can be triggered by software, and a hard fault. These all have numbers lower than zero, so no interrupt can have a higher priority than these. The API function nvic set priority can be used to set the priority for a given interrupt. If an interrupt with a higher priority is triggered while a lower priority interrupt is executing, it will preempt the execution of the lower priority interrupt. Interrupt latency can be important if the application has interrupts which must be handled quickly. The Cortex M3 has been designed to achieve low interrupt latency. When an interrupt occurs, the current machine state has to be saved by pushing some of the CPU registers on the stack before the interrupt handler can start executing. This is all done in hardware on the Cortex-M3 and takes 12 CPU cycles. If the EFM32 is in active mode or NG mode 1, this is the entire delay before the interrupt handler can start executing. When the EFM32 is in NG mode 2 or 3, the high frequency oscillator has to start before the CPU can begin entering the interrupt handler. Therefore, we have an additional wake-up time before we can start pushing the registers on the stack. 
DFM32, this wake-up time is only 2 microseconds, which ensures that even from these very low energy modes, the application can still have a fast response time. When multiple interrupts occur at the same time, the Cortex-M3 supports tail chaining, which means that the full push-pop cycle does not have to be done for each interrupt. Only six CPU cycles are needed from the point where the first interrupt service routine returns till the next can start. Without tail chaining, the example on this slide would have needed 24 cycles between the interrupts to first pop the registers and then push them back on the stack. Another concept which improves interrupt latency on the Cortex-M3 is late arrival. Late arrival means that if a higher priority interrupt occurs in the push period, it can be serviced immediately without having to do another push. In the example on this slide, IRQ2 is triggered first, and the CPU starts pushing the registers on the stack getting ready to service ISR2. However, sometime within the push period, IRQ1 is triggered and it has a higher priority than IRQ2. When the push is complete, ISR1 can then execute immediately and ISR2 is delayed. When ISR1 completes, the normal delay of 6 cycles for tail chaining occurs before ISR2 starts executing. This feature is particularly useful for high priority interrupts that must be serviced very quickly. Thanks for watching. For more information, go to energymicro.com.